content is brought to you by Algorand, which is the official sponsor of the Thinking Crypto channel and podcast. Algorand is building the technology to power the future of finance. The convergence of traditional and decentralized models into a unified system that is inclusive, frictionless, and secure. It is founded by Turing award-winning cryptographer Silvio McCalley. Algorand has developed a blockchain infrastructure that offers the interoperability and capacity to handle the volume of transactions needed for DeFi, financial institutions, and governments to smoothly transition into future five. The technology of choice for more than 700 global organizations, Algorand is enabling the simple creation of next generation financial products, protocols, and exchange of value. For more information, please visit algorand.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Muneeb Ali, who's the co-founder of Stacks. Muneeb, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, Muneeb, tell us where you're from. Where, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in a small town uh, in, in Pakistan. Uh, and I think it was a sleepy little army town and uh, there wasn't much to do there. And I discovered computers and I would basically like spend a ton of my time just in front of a computer and discovered the internet in the late 90s, which I think for that time and place was a little bit of a unique thing. Uh, because not a lot of people around me had access to the internet. And I think I experienced the culture of the early internet, like uh, Web 1.0, which was actually much more decentralized than Web, web 2.0. And interestingly, I think you could connect the dots now looking back uh, for why I'm excited about decentralization and, and, and everything that's happening in the crypto industry. And before founding Stacks, um, what did you do? Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about where you worked before, where did you go to school and things like that? Yeah, so I've always been interested in computer science, like I basically wanted to be uh, more on the cutting edge of computer research. Like I'm fascinated by how people come up with kind of like these new breakthroughs in computer science, and then how do they commercialize that technology to have a real impact on the world. Uh, so ever, ever since in my undergrad, I think it was, it was, it was the odd kid out who was actually like publishing research papers in, in, in during my undergrad, right? And uh, so got, got into... Uh, uh, Princeton University for my uh, grad school and uh, mostly focusing on internet protocols, distributed systems. And I think that's where towards the end of my, uh, my PhD is when I discovered Bitcoin. And it was a little bit like uh, that was the dis when I discovered the rabbit hole and the rabbit hole just went really, really deep and it's still going and going, right? So it's been almost like nine years now. And I think I'm still fascinated by, by the, the Bitcoin and crypto world. Well, you guys are certainly building some really cool features on top of Bitcoin, uh, which we'll, we'll get to um, because there's just so many things happening now on top of sta well, Bitcoin stacks. And then you have like city coins and things like that. Um, what are you holding your crypto portfolio? Because I'm assuming Bitcoin, I'm assuming stacks. Do you have anything else in your, your portfolio? Yeah, so I think it's uh, like I'm stacks is kind of like um, obviously I'm, I'm bullish on stacks, right? I have stacks. Uh, most of my holdings, I'm just earning Bitcoin on it, right? I am, I'm long-term bullish on it and I, I earn Bitcoin. And before Stacks, um, I, was, I was mostly in Bitcoin, right? So uh, I think if you would ask me, like, let's put aside the Stacks aspect because that's something that I work on, right? Like, so we can, we, can, we can put it on the side. So my, my almost like thesis on, on crypto has always been that I think, I would be majority in Bitcoin, like 80%, sometimes 90, sometimes 70, but in that range, but 80 is kind of like an average. And then I would experiment with a bunch of other things, right? So I'm, I'm not a maximalist. Like I, I don't think I'm one of those people who are like, hey, I'm only gonna hold Bitcoin and not touch anything. But I definitely wanna uh, experiment with stuff, see like what are the interesting new things coming up, play around with things. But in terms of like actually holding positions like i've noticed a trend that i mostly either uh would hold crypto assets in a project where i know the founders and i just want to i just believe in them and i just want to back them right uh so filecoin would be an example it's by um, juan is a friend of mine we go all the way back to like 20, 2013 2014 
And over there, like, yes, I, I think Filecoin is interesting, but I'm also holding it because I believe in Juan and, and I, I'm, I wanna back him, right? And, and similarly, uh, the other thing would be like, if there is some project that I just find like intellectually very interesting, right? So it's a, like, yeah, it might be very risky and you know, it might go to zero, but I just find it very intellectually interesting and I, I wanna be more of a part of it. So I will, I will hold some sort of a position uh, in, in that project. Yeah, for sure. And, and I follow you on Twitter and I saw some tweets where you talked about Bitcoin maximalism. And I absolutely agree with you. Like I'm bullish on Bitcoin. I have Bitcoin in my portfolio and I'm excited to see where Bitcoin goes. But I also see Bitcoin birthed uh, just so many different uh, use cases or blockchains and, and new ideas and things like that. And uh, I know you, you address some of the Bitcoin maximalism, like these folks are not looking ahead. They don't have a vision of, okay, what else are we gonna be doing to make Bitcoin uh, increase the usability and things like that? Can, can you tell us a bit about your thoughts around that and, and the, the Bitcoin maximalism? Yeah, so I think first thing to understand is the Bitcoin maximalism uh, is a fairly recent thing, right? Mm -hmm. It really, came around in 2017 when um, there were a lot of kind of like scammy projects coming online and they were actually, it, it was a little bit like initially, um, like I think the initial intentions were actually good uh, be, be behind some of the ideas, right? The initial intentions were that we need to, edu a lot of new people are entering crypto they don't understand the risks. They don't understand the difference between a project like Bitcoin or some sort of a fraud or scam going on. So people who were who were, uh, kind of like in, in the ecosystem for a while, they felt some lot of a responsibility to help educate people that, hey, there's a big difference. Like, you know, you should be, you should be, be careful about these projects and kind of like vet their claims and and th these things are very risky. I think all of that is, the, the intentions are really good, right? And also uh, pointing out the difference between Bitcoin, like how decentralized it is, how organic it is, uh, and, you know, versus some of the other projects that might be more, more centralized. I think initially, like, yes, that's education. That's, a, that's, that's likely a good thing. But what has happened over the years is that it's like a autoimmune response that has kind of like now gone wild mm -hmm. and it is kind of like eating itself at this point right and and it's it's a 2017 was the year and i was actually pretty vocal about this that um the quality of engineers and entrepreneurs in crypto was actually pretty low right mm -hmm. like there, there weren't a lot of people who understood um consensus algorithms distributed systems or at a very deep level and 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 people were basically coming up with very pine the sky type of things that are not technically even fully possible. And, but that changed in 2017, right? The industry actually matured a lot, a lot of like really uh, sophisticated engineers and computer scientists actually started entering the industry. Right. And, and, and interestingly, um, there is now a much better kind of like um, industry infrastructure for information as well. Right? Like there are things like Masari, there are things like, you know, independent publications, newsletters, there's like so much vetting that now happens where people are analyzing like all of these different projects and uh, in, in all sorts of very transparent ways. And interestingly, uh, some fairly interesting projects started coming out of that because, because you know, the, the human mind is very creative and obviously people are going to come up with new types of use cases of these technologies. And, and there is a, there's a huge market of uh, almost like a market that can replace existing internet businesses. And these types of applications are not competing with Bitcoin. Right? If Bitcoin is sound money and someone builds a decentralized exchange, on which you can actually trade sound money. That is not a competition to Bitcoin. That right. is actually complementary to Bitcoin, right? But the autoimmune response of the maximalists, because I think they put their blinders on, right? They're like, our, our message is going to be very simple. It's it, Bitcoin is the only thing, everything else out there is a scam, right? Mm -hmm. And in some ways like that, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a religious cult, right? And, and they, uh, 
and and then what happens is even some of the early Bitcoiners are not like that, but some exception. I think there are a handful of people who I think basically lend support to this maximist culture. And that's how the maximist folks are able to even justify their existence. Because look, here's an OG Bitcoiner who is also a maximist. But if you look at kind of like the average OG Bitcoiner, that person is, is not a maximist, right? Most so those people are very, some of them are very vocal, like Eric Voorhees and others who are basically saying that, hey, look, this is, this is, this is crazy. Like we, we got attracted to Bitcoin because it was an experiment. It was a new thing. It was a new and exciting thing. You can't just shut off the door to new and exciting ideas uh, now just because you only are excited about one new idea and not, not, not the other ones, right? So that, that's, that's, that's kind of like it. So I actually think that a lot of um, a lot of the early Bitcoiners, uh, like what I would like to see change is not a lot of people. Everyone kind of like tolerates the Maximus crowd. It was like, yeah, they are like that. They're toxic. They yell. They they leave a bad taste in developers' mouths. And yes, maybe they're driving some traffic away from Bitcoin. Bitcoin, frankly, I, I hate to see this. I, I, I I'm a Bitcoiner. Bitcoin is basically becoming irrelevant in the crypto industry, right? If you go, if you, if you go to a crypto conference, which is developer focused, where people are coming and they're showcasing new things that they've built, right? right. Like sometimes I would be the only person there, right? Hey, look, we have built this. Maybe sometimes you'll see a lightning developer, but generally like more than 90% of the activity that's happening in the industry right now, sadly is not happening in Bitcoin. And this is the thing that we want to change. And a lot of people have also just moved on, right? Like it's it's like the the maximists are pretty much like on the block list of most people, and the 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 folks have just moved on. That you know, here's here's what's actually happening in the industry. There are some people with blinders on who are there to kind of like just yell on the internet. Like you're not going to put up with that. Right? Like people 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 will just like ignore you, block you, and just move on. And I think that's a that's a very What's sad here, and the reason that why I speak up, is I, I I don't think that most of the Bitcoiners are like this, and I don't think that we need to just give in to the loud minority. Sure, I think you need to put the loud minority in their own box. Like, oh, you're free to have your own opinions and go live in a box somewhere, but you are, you are, you do not represent Bitcoin. Bitcoin stands for freedom. Bitcoin stands for anyone. We are accepting to anyone, as you said, like you hold Bitcoin. To me, you're a Bitcoiner, right? I'm not going to define you as like, hey, you're not a Bitcoiner unless the only thing uh, that you hold is Bitcoin and the only thing you care about is Bitcoin. And I'm going to try and impose, like you're basically, uh, there are paradoxes in maximalist thinking. Mm -hmm. Like they would um, say that they believe in freedom and yet they want to impose their thinking on other people, right? If you believe in freedom, let everyone do whatever they're doing, right? Like let let right. like, and, and 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 similarly, they would have problems with how people are using the Bitcoin network. How can you have? How, how can you do that? Bitcoin is an open network. It is a decentralized network. The entire purpose of Bitcoin is anyone can use Bitcoin however they want to use it. Right. So if we have built a uh, programming layer for Bitcoin, we're not changing Bitcoin. Like we have very specifically designed SACS in a way that it requires no changes from Bitcoin. Now people are using that network. That network is, is get, actually getting more traction than any of the other solutions which might be more popular in the Maximus circles, right? People mm -hmm. are actually using these things. It's getting traction. Developers love it. Developers are building new things on it. On an open decentralized network, how can you even, even stop it? Like, right. you, you know, it's not even technically possible for, for you to stop it. Right. It's not ideologically aligned for you to stop, for, for you to even try and stop something like that. Right? If you don't want to support it, don't support it. But I don't think it matters. Like, I don't think their opinion actually matters. The a bunch of loud voices on Twitter, like it's 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 irrelevant. Uh, and and I think like where um, where I would love to see is. Um, more intellectual discourse coming back to Bitcoin, 
mm-hmm. where people start it's a, it's a little bit like a lot of uh, my friends have started recently realizing that some of the conversations around bitcoin especially in the in the maxi circles they're just becoming like so like boring and there there's only x amount of time you can talk about the monetary policy of bitcoin that is not changing right, right? like at some point you need you need new ideas you need to talk you need something new and exciting needs to happen where there's a new use case of of uh, of the technology like for example this morning i discovered that developers implemented lightning to bitcoin nft swaps uh, through stacks that's exciting as hell right like look here's an amazing new use case nft markets are you know billions of dollars and now people can use the lightning network to directly purchase bitcoin nfts that's amazing that's mind blowing right right and and that's the kind of excitement that i would love to see in the bitcoin community that here here are the new things developers are building here is how we can grow the bitcoin economy versus basically trying to shut yourself down and having a very negative angry attitude towards the rest of the crypto industry yeah absolutely i i totally agree with you um there's so many things that and you guys are obviously on the building side of it with stacks and there's so many other things that could be done on top of bitcoin but if folks are just like you said you know their their heads in the ground and just sound money sound money okay but what else there's there there's other things that could be built here to increase like you said the bitcoin economy um so on that note tell us about stacks for those who don't uh, know about stacks or haven't heard about it um, how did the idea come about and what features are, are in use cases are you enabling on top of Bitcoin? Yep. Uh, so one, one, one quick thing that I think uh, I also want to differentiate between people who uh, are kind of like Bitcoin only versus some of the, the maximalist crowd. And I think the key difference is that someone could say that, look, you know, I have only enough time and attention. I just want to focus on Bitcoin. Sure. I just, I just want to, I just want to focus on it. I think Jack Dorsey is, is kind of like that, right? Like he's like, look, I, Bitcoin is very fundamental. I just want to focus my energy there. I'm totally supportive of that, right? Like I'm, 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 I'm like, I'm one of those people that I, I can get distracted, right? So I have all these systems to stay focused and I, I get that, right? Like it's easy and simple to just focus on something. I think the big difference between the Bitcoin only crowd, and they tend to be like much more humble and, and friendly uh, and, and, and reasonable, right? And it makes sense like, hey, yeah, sure. You just want to focus on Bitcoin, just go and do your thing. Versus the Maximus crowd is that they're actively hostile towards everything that is non-Bitcoin. Yeah. And they actually spend a ton, they're not, they're not actually spending their time and energy trying to benefit Bitcoin. They're actually spending a ton of their time and energy just trying to annoy other people. Yeah, right? <laughs> and that is not a good use of time for anybody, right? So I think that's that's a, that's a very important um, distinction between people who are Bitcoin only versus this very toxic type of a community that uh, has, has sadly kind of like taken over a lot of the discussions in in, in the Bitcoin community. For sure. Yep. So with, with that, uh, you know. The, the, the way forward is like you keep building, right? Like you keep building and you keep growing and uh, you attract like a ton of developers and ton of actual users and, and you just move forward. And this is, this is what I think uh, what matters in the long run. Like if, if, if something is working and something is, is successful, people, people will just use it and, and, and that's it. So th- thinking, thinking about stacks, right? Um, so big, think of stacks as a two layer solution so Bitcoin is the sound money layer and Stacks is the, is the programming layer, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas if you go to Ethereum, Ethereum is trying to be both uh, money and gas for smart contracts in the same layer, mm-hmm. right? So, and, and Ethereum is actually much more complicated at the base layer. So over here, the only difference is that we have divided things into two layers. And just like Lightning is a faster payments layer, for Bitcoin, Stacks is a programming layer for Bitcoin. So what happens is the, the benefits of this approach are that A, we are not asking for any changes from Bitcoin, right? Mm-hmm. Because smart contracts are more risky. Smart contracts can introduce like more complication in a blockchain. So Bitcoin remains simple and Bitcoin can be a simple base layer for sound money, right? 
And the, the programming layer stacks can actually evolve independently of Bitcoin. So we recently, there was a network upgrade that happened, required zero changes from Bitcoin. Uh, the network just upgraded. Uh, and, and, and I think, whereas if you were doing that on Ethereum, you would have to do a hard fork on Ethereum base layer. Right? And that's, that's a much more risky thing to do with a large kind of like network with a large uh, market cap. So, so that's, that, oh, sorry, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, I was gonna say, so, so Stacks sits on top of Bitcoin as a layer two and it's bringing smart contract technology um, or features to, to Bitcoin. Yes, so I think some people do think of it as a layer two. Technically it's not a layer two. Uh, sometimes like, it, like, it's actually like hard to place things in layer ones or twos. Stacks mm -hmm. is somewhere in the middle. And sometimes I'd say it's like a layer 1.5 if you really have to think of it that way. But um, but yeah, conceptually think of that as a programming layer, like something that is separate from the Bitcoin base layer and it is settling transactions in Bitcoin. Right? Mm -hmm. So if if there are, let's say a thousand transactions in a block on, on Stacks, all those transactions are settling on Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has a history of, all the potential uh, fork histories of stacks, right? Mm -hmm. So if someone wants to basically say that this thing never happened on stacks, they would have to go and fork Bitcoin. Gotcha. So this this is how stacks benefits from, from the security of Bitcoin. And the protocol that's used, I think I saw proof of transfer, is, is that correct? Yes. So the way to think of proof of transfer is that it's, um, it's, it's, it's like trying to recycle proof of work because Bitcoin miners have already done proof of work, we don't need to do proof of work. We can actually use a recycled proof of work to build the consensus system. So it's a, it's a little bit like, you know, visually you can imagine that Bitcoin has its own consensus mechanism and it's using proof of work. Stacks has a consensus that is cross-chain. It's between Bitcoin and Stacks. Right? So you're connecting two layers to, to each other. And the consensus algorithm over there uh, doesn't require proof of work because we can just recycle proof, proof of work in, in the form of Bitcoin. Hmm. So people are actually, instead of like uh, burning electricity and, uh, and having expensive hardware to have some probability of becoming a miner, people are actually bidding to become a miner by, by spending Bitcoin because that's capital that you're actually spending and to have a probability of becoming a miner on, for, for stacks. Interesting. Um, can you tell us a bit about the tokenomics of the STX token? Yes, so I think uh, it, the way to think about it is that uh, Stacks is a unique asset, actually the only asset out there that has a native Bitcoin yield. Mm -hmm. right? So if you are, and the, and the reason for that basically comes from uh, this criticism of gas assets, that why would you ever want to hold a gas asset? Like if the utility of the gas asset is that I should just buy it when I want to use it, right? Uh, and I actually don't believe in that because I think the reason is that uh, these all these networks are at a very, very early stages. So you are in a price discovery stage most of the time because you don't know how big this network is going to be and how valuable, what is the what is the optimum price of gas on this network? Because it's a, it's a supply and demand thing, right? Like you, as more and more applications are trying to compete for the block space on the smart contract platform, you're, you're having to pay higher gas fees, right? Mm. So that's, that's why I don't, I don't believe in that criticism that, hey, you just buy the, the gas token when, uh, when you need to, because if you believe that this network might actually grow a lot, in the next years and gas is cheap right now. You could store some gas and then use it when, when, when in the time when you need it down the road, right? right. But, but even, even, even to add another layer to it, um, you, so if Stacks is the gas, uh, gas fee to, uh, token, if you hold it, you're actually earning Bitcoin on it, right? So it, it becomes like a productive asset that you can use it to pay for smart contracts but if you're not using it, you're actually earning a yield on that. And the yield is in, a yield is in Bitcoin. So I think it's a very unique type of asset uh, in, in that way. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, when I first saw that um, and 
you know, given that I work for OKCoin, I started uh, participating in that to earn Bitcoin. So that, that's just a, a really cool feature. Um, now, there is building on top of stacks, um, and that is city coins. Tell us about how that idea came about and how th these city coins are functioning on top of stacks. Yeah, so I think um, like we, we, we believe in um, kind of scaling Bitcoin out in layers, right? So Bitcoin is the base layer, the money layer, uh, stacks is the programming layer, and then anyone can come in and, and start you know, any project on top. Stacks is a completely decentralized system. There are many kind of companies working here. So there's the Citicoin project. It was very organic. I think there were some ideas by like Balaji and Patrick and, and uh, me and others. Generally, I think the idea is, uh, is a little bit like, what can we do to have a public private partnership between city and people who are interested in that city? Right, mm -hmm. like a city government and people who are interested in that city, right? My my lens on that is a little bit like, you know, at some point cities onboarded to Web 2.0 by making websites and building government services that you can just use online. Like my lens is more like how would cities onboard to crypto, mm -hmm. right? How would they start using crypto? It makes a ton of sense for a local government to actually have some sort of a crypto treasury. Right, that they can they can use and actually people to have some sort of a say in more transparent um, use of that treasury, right? So I think it's it's hard to kind of like pinpoint. Like I think uh, Patrick and Balaji they they deserve a lot of credit for a lot of the early ideas. I kind of like um, acted as a sound <laughs> sounding board and 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 uh, gave my input here and there, but. It's a, it's a little bit like, and the community just ran with it, right? Like the, the amazing thing about the CityCoin project is uh, it's fully decentralized. It's mining only, right? Independent miners kind of like came in and just launched the thing. And often like, you know, the cities are not even involved. Uh, and then the cities, so how Miami coin launched was like the community just went ahead and built this thing. Um, and then Mayor Shores noticed it and he was like, oh, this is actually pretty interesting. And he, he, and uh, I think it will it will go down in history like what he did. Like it was such a big moment when he actually uh, got a vote done at the local government level in Miami to officially accept the Miami Coin Protocol and the Treasury uh, and use it. Right, I think that's truly historic that a mayor to be like that forward looking and embrace new technologies instead of like trying uh, trying trying to fight them. Uh, so the so the idea basically becomes that uh, a portion of the mining kind of like uh, revenue is going to a treasury that the city can then use. And interestingly, because this is built on stacks, the treasury can earn a Bitcoin yield. And then Mayor Suarez uh, announced that what we are going to do is we're going to take the Bitcoin that we're getting from our treasury and basically onboard citizens of Miami by giving them by, by giving them Bitcoin, right? So that, that's amazing that a, uh, that a U.S. city is actually working on onboarding their, their, their uh, citizens to Bitcoin by giving them free Bitcoin. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's like just, just like amazing to see. And here are the type of things that become possible. Like I would have never thought that Miami would end up doing this or something like city coins would even exist when I was working on stacks. Right. Mm -hmm. But because it's a programming layer, because it opens up the possibilities for new ideas to be able to implement it, like we are, I think that's how you grow Bitcoin. You grow Bitcoin by enabling developers, by giving them the right tools to then go off and build whatever that they want to build. And I think that's the kind of thing that we've seen um, happen over and over again on the internet. Like when uh, the reason why TCPIP and some of the foundational internet protocols were successful is a ton of developers came in and they started building all sorts of things on top, right? Yeah. And I think that's a critical lesson that I don't think the Bitcoin community has fully internalized, mm -hmm. that the only thing that in my mind that matters right now is that how quickly are developers coming in 
and building new things around this technology. I think that's the fastest way to actually growing the Bitcoin economy. So like imagine if, you know, right now Bitcoin mostly trades on centralized exchanges. Let's say somebody builds a really good decentralized exchange for Bitcoin through, through Stacks. And that exchange is now uh, gaining trading volume. And at some point, maybe it, uh, the trading volume is higher than Coinbase or others, and it has already happened in Ethereum. Uniswap was doing more, 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 more trades than uh, than Coinbase. So now you've created a decentralized exchange that doesn't require KYC, that doesn't require you know there, any centralization risks for Bitcoiners to go and use their Bitcoin, right? So you are actually growing the pie for for Bitcoin. Same with like Bitcoin lending. Same with all sorts of like other interesting things that you can do with Bitcoin. Like if you plug in Bitcoin into NFT marketplaces, now you are pouring in like a trillion dollars of liquidity into a marketplace and, and letting people kind of like trade these things, right? And, and we as humans have always benefited when there's free flowing trade, when, when people can actually more easily trade things uh, and grow the economic pie for, for everybody. And I think there's a huge opportunity right now, like Bitcoin is winning on the sound money aspect, but it is not winning on easily deploying the Bitcoin capital. Like very few uh, percent, like I think less than 1% of Bitcoin right now is wrapped on Ethereum and that's how it's productive. 99% of the Bitcoin is basically just sitting there. Right? And, and, and making that Bitcoin productive is, basically the biggest unlock that can happen in, in, in the coming years. Yeah. I, I mean, I just love it. I, I, when I heard about city coins and what, what was happening, like, wow, this is pretty amazing. And, you know, like you said, there's a sound money use case, but there's so many other opportunities, which you guys are, you know, helping to come to fruition. And like you said, the cities can, they can look, they can buy the Bitcoin hole in, on their balance sheet, but the city coins, uh, gives another avenue for them to earn Bitcoin and and I guess get around some of the politics and budget concerns because if it's crowdsourced and it's coming in that way and they're earning a Bitcoin and giving to the citizens, it just seems like a much more I don't know fair or economic. Yeah, no, it's it's the the innovation behind city coins is very fundamental, right? Like because. I think you could make this argument that, hey, cities should just buy Bitcoin. But if you look a little deeper, what are they going to buy Bitcoin with? Yeah. Most, most of the cities are so under budgeted that they barely are able to keep up with their spending. Right? Mm -hmm. So they don't, they don't even have money like, to go out there and start putting Bitcoin on, on their balance sheet. They're, a lot of the cities are living like pretty much like hand to mouth, right? Like they're, they can't even balance their budget on a, on a very short term basis. And they mostly rely on tax revenue. And interestingly, this is what Mayor Shora saw that he saw that by creating kind of like this, with creating kind of like this new, almost like revenue stream for the city, uh, you might actually be able to reduce taxes in the future. Or, or in an extreme case, like maybe even eliminate taxes uh, for the citizens of, 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 uh, of Miami, which will be amazing, right? So that's, I think the key argument is that when someone says that, oh no, just go and buy Bitcoin to a city, you are operating in the same economic pie and you're basically saying that somehow come up with the purchasing power to go buy Bitcoin. Mm. What City Coins is doing is actually growing the economic pie. Yeah. So when you're growing the economic pie, the city actually has additional capacity to do to do new and interesting things. And I think there's a huge difference between the two things. Mm, yeah, I, you know what it made me think about too is you just mentioned with the tax item. You know, certain states, I think like Alaska, due to oil um, and others, and even we saw with marijuana and, and Colorado they were able to reduce taxes as a result. And, and this could certainly be a catalyst for helping some of these states to do that. Yep, absolutely. It, it, I think this is like a, this, this is a concept that has repeated so many times. Like imagine, imagine the internet economy. It didn't really exist in the, in the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. So people came in and created new things that actually created, that just expanded the economic pie. 
of the internet economy. And now the internet economy, like imagine how many people are employed by the internet economy. Like most people uh, like that we know, they are basically in one way or the other earning their salary to, as being part of the internet economy, right? Like look at, look at Uber drivers, like how many people uh, like earn their living just by being an Uber driver. There was a market for uh, cabs but it was a very inefficient market. And, and, and somebody came in and, and actually created a much bigger market, expanded the economic pie, and a lot more people started benefiting. So I think you're trying to do that with the cities, that it's a very inefficient type of a system. They're kind of like stuck in a very small type of an economy. And how can we provide more efficient ways of expanding the economic pie so that there can be more efficient systems, not just on, uh, on um, kind of like the economic side of it, but also like in terms of participation in, gov in governance, how many citizens even care or participate in the local government? Like I've been in New York for like a decade. I, I don't care, I haven't participated in anything, right? And, but where, whereas there is already a community of people who are uh, using things like Miami coin to have a voice in like how this treasury should be used because it's exciting, it's new, right? Like it's super easy, like you're just, there's a uh, there's a proposal and and you're already on your computer all the time and uh, you can use your holdings of Miami coin to vote on something right not only is that exciting it's actually super easy and it enhances engagement of citizens or or people who are just interested in in that city and the local government right so you can imagine it can you you can start seeing like DAOs uh, around these technologies where people who are actually stakeholders um, they can have a say in what the government is doing. And interestingly, because uh, these, these city coins can have a market cap, right? Yeah. So uh, imagine like there, let's say there, there is a, there, the, the SF coin doesn't exist yet, but let's say an SF coin existed and, and a Miami coin existed. Every time Mayor Suarez announced a good policy for the city that was welcoming to crypto or tech, uh, the markets reacted by, by, by the price of that coin going up. Okay. And every time San Francisco announced a bad policy that is actually driving away economic activity from that city, people are becoming bearish on the city. And that is reflected in the market price, right? Wow. Then pol politicians have actually real-time feedback into what they're doing. This is how public companies work, right? Like if you had a bad quarter, you know, the markets would hammer you and give you the signal that you need to do something differently. And, and I think cities just don't have that. Like it's, it, they, they have elections every, every so often and then not a lot of people are actually participating. You don't have this like real time uh, ticker that, that is based on like, kind of like, you know, how good or bad that, that city government is actually performing. Well, one could argue that this is helping to bring full democracy to fruition, I'm not saying that we didn't have it before, but in in uh, the evolution of it, where people have more of a say, uh, which I find very fascinating and, and could really be a game changer for the future of, of the country and, this, and cities and states and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know you're, you guys are probably working a lot. I don't know what you can disclose, but what's on the Stacks roadmap for 2022? What, what can you tell us about? That you guys are working on yeah so i think the, the first thing that i always like to clarify is that unlike a bunch of other crypto projects where there's usually like a big company right like there's some sort of a labs company that is uh, the primary company behind the project there is no such thing in the, in the in the stacks ecosystem because we were very careful with decentralization the stacks project effectively decentralized before the launch of the mainnet mm -hmm. and there are 30 plus different companies in the ecosystem. So I work for this company called Hero, which is a dev tooling company, right? So we have, we are, our focus is to use, so Stacks itself is open source, decentralized, independent miners run it. Uh, no big companies are kind of like behind it. Several kind of like uh, companies contribute to the ecosystem. And my company is focused on, on uh, dev tooling. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that, you know, sometimes it's challenging as well, right? Because sometimes people are looking at like, hey, what's the roadmap of the project? And it's very easy to create a roadmap when there's centralization, 
right? Someone says like, here's a roadmap of, uh, of the project. And we are more like Bitcoin, right? Like Bitcoin has a lot of Bitcoin improvement proposals. Nobody really knows which improvement proposals are actually going to get accepted, right? And different companies like Blockstream might say that, hey, we are actually working on X this year. So Hero Systems could say, we are working on this thing this year, but there's no like universal roadmap for, for, for stacks. Right. And I think it, it actually can be challenging at times, right? Because people are used to uh, these projects that are much more centralized and, you know, they will give you a roadmap. Like this, this, this is what we're doing. Sure. But uh, uh, in general, generally, broadly speaking, I think there's a ton of work happening on scalability. And given the decentralized nature, uh, Hero Systems is working on one scalability uh, solution. Uh, there are other uh, de- open source developers who are working on other types of scalability solutions. So we will basically see uh, similar to like, you know, Ethereum, like many different types of scalability solutions came online. Uh, we're seeing a bunch of different scalability stuff c- coming online. Again, we scale in layers, right? So Stacks is the programming layer. And now you can have something like a subnet, something that I'm working on, uh, which is like really fast transactions. Uh, and and it, it, it enables basically another really fast high transaction throughput layer around Stacks. Uh, so that's one thing. I know a bunch of people are working on uh, better Bitcoin liquidity, right? So uh, I was talking about these lightning swaps that went live yesterday that you could actually buy Bitcoin NFTs through lightning. That's actually opening up lightning liquidity into the ecosystem, which is huge. But similarly, you can open up Bitcoin liquidity through Bitcoin swaps. Like, so you can just do a Bitcoin transaction and buy into a NFT marketplace or buy into a DeFi protocol. So I think... And again, there are a bunch of these solutions, but when some of them go live, the native UX for uh, a user might be that you're actually using a Bitcoin wallet and you're just doing a Bitcoin transaction and you're interacting with applications and smart contracts on stacks, which I think would be a huge unlock because that is that is the most unique thing about stacks that it is unlocking Bitcoin capital. Right, it is, it is, and Bitcoin is a trillion dollars in asset, right? So that's that's really like the big market uh, that that we are working on. So I, I think there, those are those are some of the things that uh, I'm looking forward to in 2022. That's awesome, um, and you, you know, I'm I'm excited to see what it, or some of the new things people create. Uh, you know, kind of like how City Coins came about. Um, let's jump to the crypto market as a whole. And talk a bit more about Bitcoin. Uh, we're seeing a lot of adoption. Corporates putting Bitcoin in their balance sheet. El Salvador making legal tender. Um, and there seems to be a mining boom in the United States, which I think everybody's happy about. The, the hash rate has become more decentralized globally. You know, what are your thoughts? Do, do we continue to see this into 2022? Could some other tech companies, I don't know, Google, Apple, put Bitcoin in their balance sheet? Could another country follow El Salvador's model? What are your thoughts and outlook? I think I think yes, potentially. I'm very I'm very bullish on Bitcoin. Um, I think that Bitcoin is the way I think about it is Bitcoin is winning as uh, as as like the money in in the real world. Mm. Right? All of these are real world examples, like big public companies doing this or like a country doing it, and so on. Where Bitcoin is lagging right now and uh, things like ethereum and others are winning is money on the internet Mm. right like if you look at nft trading volumes most of that is in ethereum yeah like bitcoin bitcoin is not being used there Uh, or if you look at decentralized exchanges right most most of the trading volume is actually outside of bitcoin so while i'm bullish on bitcoin as sound money real world use cases, which is, you can't underestimate that, right? Like this is huge, it's changing people's lives. I think that Bitcoin is lagging behind in Bitcoin use as money on, within the, the crypto industry, right? Mm-hmm. Well, over there, what I mean is, uh, why isn't Bitcoin used in the new kind of like crypto games that are coming up? Why isn't Bitcoin used in like NFT marketplaces? Why isn't Bitcoin used in decentralized exchanges, decentralized lending protocols and so on? And I think that's a huge opportunity. And whenever you see people bearish on Bitcoin in the crypto industry, they're mostly bearish because of these reasons. Mm -hmm. 
they're saying that the the entire internet economy is going to get disrupted. Most of that is actually digital. Even though Bitcoin is gaining adoption as like, hey, maybe you can buy coffee uh, with lightning at a Starbucks in El Salvador. That's amazing. They're looking at the internet economy. Right. Can I buy an NFT with Bitcoin? The answer is no right now. Right? Mm. So I, I think that's why I am, that's the reason for me to be bullish on, on the real world use cases. And I think Bitcoin is winning a sound money. But I do think there is a massive opportunity uh, for for the digital use cases. And, and this is pretty much like why we exist, right? Like we see that major opportunity and we want to we wanna unlock that. But I think if you talk to uh fairly intelligent, sophisticated people in the industry, uh, if they are bearish on Bitcoin and they're spending time on other types of uh, projects, the primary reason that they would tell you is, is this one, that, hey, Bitcoin is basically right now, you can't build stuff on Bitcoin. You can't build decentralized exchanges, NFT marketplaces, and all these things using Bitcoin. And I think that's the big uh, aha moment that if as Stacks is growing, people would realize, oh, wait a minute, I actually don't need to go to another ecosystem to do these things. I can just do it in Bitcoin. And I think that's that's going to be a major, major uplift. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, th- this just might be a tricky question. I don't know if you can really answer it, um, but do you feel this bull market cycle is over? Uh, if not, uh, you know, some people have the lengthening cycles theory you have a Bitcoin price prediction for the peak of this cycle. Yeah, so I think there's, if you would have talked to me like a month or two months ago, I would have been very bullish that this bull market is not over. Um, I think you're t- talking to me now, it's January, right? And and if you look at the number of days historically bull markets last after a, a halving, uh, I think that time period has expired or close to expired. So uh, in that sense, like it's possible that it, it, it might be over. I think I'm 60, 40 right now. The 60%, it's not, not over. And um, the reason is that I think the industry has matured. Mm. So we can't just expect the same type of cycles to occur over and over again. Right? So the, the, that's, the, that's my reason number one. And the reason number two is that I think I've seen the previous bull markets and bull markets typically become really crazy, right? Before they pop and we go into a bear market. And yeah. at no point, like I felt like things became that crazy. Right. right? And it, it's possible that maybe the craziness was happening somewhere else. Like maybe uh, maybe some of the NFT markets were just going completely bonkers and I wasn't paying that much attention there or I wasn't really directly a part of it, right? Or the main only... <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So uh, it's possible that I, I just didn't feel it because I wasn't really a part of it, but it, to me, just hasn't felt like the kind of craziness that I've, I've seen in the past, right? Or, yeah. or during a traditional bull market. So if Bitcoin would have crossed like 100K or something, like that that would have been a clear thing that, okay, fine. Now, now brace yourself for a landing. Um, yeah, I have a similar sentiment. It's we just kind of have to wait and see. Uh, but like you said, you know, given I've been part of some of the previous bull runs, haven't seen that true euphoria mania phase, and hopefully it's it's on its way <laughs> sometime this year. But we'll have to wait and see. Um, let's talk about crypto regulations. You know, Bitcoin is not so much in the crosshair of U.S. crypto regulations. Um, although we're still waiting for a Bitcoin spot ETF from the SEC, and uh, but the SEC seems to be putting up roadblocks for all, all other altcoins, if you want to call them that. You know, what are your thoughts? And and do you see like Congress has to step in here to to pass comprehensive crypto regulations? Yeah, I think I think like the the work that Gary Gensler is doing is basically like, look, here are the existing laws and I'm here to enforce them. And I'm going to enforce them as widely and as strictly as possible. Uh, and they're basically just going after everybody. Uh, and I think realistically, like given like, you know, that every other day a new decentralized exchange pops up on some new project, 
like this is such a decentralized world that I, I think even if you like 100x or 1000x the staff at the SEC, they would not be able to keep up with what's happening in the industry. So I think practically speaking, I don't think it's a very, um, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's going to work, right? Like something has to change. And there have been some proposals um, right. like the um, safe harbor proposal from, uh, from Hester. And I think, I think something like that could be very interesting that, hey, entrepreneurs, you have three years to get started, but at some point you really need to show that you're decentralized enough. And I think that's the key problem. Like how do you prove that you're decentralized enough? That's the, that's the, the Ripple versus SEC case that's going on, right? Like someone is saying we're decentralized, they're saying you're not, right? So how do you prove that? And I do think like our, we as an industry need to do more work there. We have played our role. Like we actually released a decentralization legal framework. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Wilson Sonsini, one of the top lawyers uh, in the country, uh, they work with us. They release a legal uh, framework for uh, just looking at the hobby test, which is what the SEC uses, that here's how decentralization has occurred uh, in, in the Stacks ecosystem. Right. So I think it's a start. Uh, and pairing that with something like the safe harbor proposal could be could be very powerful. That if you say that you have here's a safe harbor, you have three years, and then here is some sort of a legal framework for decentralization, and you need to be uh, decentralized by the end of the safe harbor expi- expiry. I think I think something like that. And the other other path forward is that if uh, there's new new laws, if a crypto industry. Be- is already pretty big and if they can actually work with the congress on new types of regulations and laws like i think that's a path forward for sure a couple more questions and we'll wrap it up um where do you see the crypto market in five years or so and and maybe maybe you can talk specifically from a bitcoin standpoint given that it's it's leading the market um and where do you see adoption in five years yeah, so I think um, the five-year question is the easy one, right? Like if you ask me like what would happen this year or next year, that's like, we don't know, right? Like we might be going through a bear market and uh, or something. Five years is easy, right? Like we're, we're so early. Like I think people forget how early we are. Like it's entirely possible, like the entire crypto industry is sitting at like 2 trillion. It's entirely possible we are at 2% right now. Mm. Like all of this might look like a blip in, in the long run, because this is disrupting the entire internet economy. This is disrupting like m- money. Like imagine like how much money there is out in the world and like a hundred trillion number on the crypto industry might actually be low because mm. some people talk about Bitcoin um, reaching like those sorts of levels because 10 trillion is just the gold market cap. Bitcoin is much more than gold, right? Like it's, it, it, and so I, I do think like from that perspective, uh, the best data point would be the size of the internet economy. And some of these crypto protocols are actually disrupting very, very large traditional internet economy businesses, right? And, and I think when that flips and all of that gets absorbed by the crypto industry, the, the 2 trillion market cap of crypto would look tiny. Right. And a five years is a very long time. This is we're already at a stage where a bunch of the big companies are already looking into crypto, like Facebook, uh, Square, and, and I think the, the list kind of like goes on and on, where these really large internet tech giants are basically like, uh, hey, crypto is the future, and we we basically need to come in and, and work here. Yeah, for sure. All right, some uh, wrap up questions here. If you could create your own metaverse, what would it be about? What what would the theme be? Uh, I think uh, it will be snow crash. <laughs> cool. Uh, so rapid fire questions. Favorite food? Ah, favorite food. Um, I don't know. I'm a very simple man. I, I can eat pizzas and pasta. <laughs> favorite musician or band? Uh, let's see. I think U2 is coming to mind right now. Cool. Favorite movie? The Matrix. Well, did you see... Uh, I Are, haven't, and I, I don't plan to. I think it would, it would ruin the original Matrix for me. Oh, uh, yeah, don't do not do it. I, I <laughs> it ruined it for me. Uh, favorite book? Uh, interesting. Uh, I think there is, um, 
I can tell you the book I'm I'm reading right now is called Nero Mantra. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like a it's like a sci-fi type of a thing. Awesome. And when when you're not working on stacks or Bitcoin, what are you doing for fun as a hobby? So I get criticized for not having hobbies, right? <laughs> it's a, it's literally like um, I had some downtime uh, towards the end of the year, and what I started doing was like I was. Uh, upgrading my personal VPNs that I deploy to use, or uh, I was looking into these self-hosting encrypted email services, right? And n- n- like, I, I, maybe that qualifies as a hobby, but it looks like work to people around me. Like I'm in front of a computer and I'm like messing around with, with one thing or the other. Uh, well, you're, it sounds like you're a techie at heart. Like that's, that's your passion. So it, it becomes your hobby. Um, Mani, uh, pleasure chatting with you, and I'm looking forward to all the great uh, releases and updates around Stacks this year. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. Awesome. This is great. Thanks a lot.